The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to this month's Alcor webinar, Unlock Cloud Visibility and Control with Alcor Implementation of ServiceNow Integrated with Snow Commander. We will begin in just a few minutes. Alcor is pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar. Alcor Solutions is a global digital transformation services company serving Fortune 500, government agencies, and other leading organizations in, mul in multiple industry verticals across Canada, US, Europe, Japan, and India. Alcor advises leading businesses on cloud platforms, digital workflows, technology and robotic automation, enterprise service management, HR solutions, integrated risk management, and data analytics. We also provide business process consulting to capture, re-engineer, and improve processes that can be easily automated to deliver real value. The Alcor consulting team has excellence in business strategy, cloud technology, and organizational change management. Alcor is a ServiceNow Elite Partner AWS Partner, and Oracle Gold Partner, and also works with Snow Software, Azure, Salesforce, Inquarter, PeopleRain, Tanium, and several other cutting-edge technologies. For today's webinar, Alcor partnered with Snow, uh, Snow Software. Snow Software is changing the way organizations understand and manage their technology consumption. Their technology intelligence platform provides comprehensive visibility and contextual insight across software, SaaS, hardware, and cloud. With Snow, IT leaders can effectively optimize resources, enhance performance, and enable operational agility in a hybrid world. We have some time reserved in the end of the webinar for Q&A, so please feel free to type any questions into the questions section of the webinar dashboard. Today's webinar topic is Unlock Cloud Visibility and Control, presented by Ali Mahmoud, Director of Product at Snow, Brent Kniffer, Chief Architect at Alcor, and Colin Jack, 
Global Solution Architect at Snow. I will now turn the webinar over to our presenters. Thank you very much. This is Brent Knipfer. We're very glad to have you here. And we are going to talk about end-to-end -end resource and operations management focused on hybrid and multi-cloud. Please move forward, Colin. Some of you may be familiar with the Gardner wheel. Uh, this is a variation on that. We think an improvement. On the left, you see uh, cloud provisioning and all the aspects that are needed to really have a closed loop end to end lifecycle solution. So if you start there about the 11 o'clock position with service requests, uh, we believe that it is best to have self service requests and it should reach as forward as you can to the business, to the customer's customer, to be able to provision full environments and applications ready to be used. And so that leads us right to the provisioning and orchestration as we go around the clock. And as a real cloud broker, Snow and ServiceNow together can work across any kind of cloud infrastructure, cloud environment, uh, on-premise environment, and you'll see that today. And as we move forward, of course, cost management is of utmost importance these days, especially with COVID, with pandemic around the world, with other uh, many other influences causing acquisitions, divestures, uh, opportunities to capture savings or to further optimize your spend. And then the identity security compliance equally important now across the landscape to make sure that everything we're doing across cloud, uh, DevOps, CI, CD is secure at every step of the process. Migrating, backup, uh, adjusting to, to achieve cost goals or business needs is then becomes the most critical aspect as you work through the entire uh, actual life of uh, cloud resources. Packaging and delivering them is something that continually can be looked at as people may desire to change the kinds of services that you're consuming in those cloud environments. Monitoring analytics uh, become critical to look at the continual journey, uh, that digital transformation journey, maturity journey, business journey that you're on. And then inventory and classification, everything around the impact of change of whether that's organizational or technology wise needs to be addressed and understood. We see many of the cloud providers there across the bottom and the partnerships and integrations in the cloud landscape are continuing to increase dramatically. So we've listed three or four here in each of these areas as we go down the uh, different work streams here in the left side of that right box. And then uh, we, we have many of the players, no doubt you on the phone are on this webinar are using many of these and how do you optimize the use of them is the question colin yeah i think brent if i could just add to that Please, there colin. is no such thing as a single tool that's going to solve every problem that you have but on this webinar what we want to focus on is from an operations perspective from a resource management perspective from an end-to-end -end, uh, stream how do you integrate all of those tools? How do you bring together all of your processes into the best practices that you want to enforce across the business? So it's not about replacing all of those individual tools, but bringing them all together and making the team more effective. But I'll, I'll let you continue, Brent. Yes, thank you very much. So as we look at the evolution of cloud, most of you are going to already have experienced all three of these aspects, private cloud, public cloud, and multi-cloud. And we see the journey continuing to move more and more to the right for most people. It's not a question of whether people are going to be multi-cloud, it's whether they're going to have two or three, whether they're going to need to include a private cloud, whether they're going to be using aspects of the public cloud. Um, we see all three of these at play, but much more of the trend is for things to be moving over to the right. The other point I'd like to make is you can see that cost uh, and uh, is in all three buckets. Uh, there are aspects that are affecting all three areas and resources and what resources we're deploying, what resources we should continue to use are included in all three. Let's move forward. So here is another way of looking at the hybrid nature of infrastructure. And again, it's what we're finding is that it's not this or that, but rather a progression. For instance, in hybrid delivery, most start with infrastructure as a service, but they want to move up this stack. 
towards platform and software as a service. Uh, in the hybrid infrastructure, uh, we are all, if you are a very big company or have much breadth to your customers, almost all of us are out there at the edge. For instance, content management in one way or the other is often deployed at the edge. We all still have things on premise. We find many customers still want to have their identity or access on premise or critical business data, uh, people data, uh, revenue data stored still on premise, but they want the core of the solution to be delivered in the cloud. We see applications in all aspects may start with an initial like-for-like -like migration from where it currently is an end-tier structure, client server structure into the cloud, but eventually look at containers and going cloud native as they progress. And then finally, we see resource consumption that is, is both owned by IT and the business or owned only by the business. And then IT learns about that as a shadow uh, resource that eventually comes under better controls and governance. Let's move forward. So the, the roles are changing. And here, as we continue the slide, uh, progression, go ahead and play it out, Colin. You'll see that uh, there are is going to become an increasing number of roles and responsibilities involved. SecOps and financial operations have become uh, a larger play, and we're seeing a stronger uh, flow down from Google of site reliability engineering. On the process side, many different ways of delivering, and there's even hybrid models involved in here, waterfall, scrum fall, et cetera but a continual push to become more and more relevant, more real time, more valuable to the business, more focused on outcomes. And then we see the evolution. Uh, another one that's not listed here, we're hearing is bring your own vendor, not your own device, but provide it a structure in the cloud in which any business or any project can bring a new vendor, vendor into the organization and fully empower them with you know, applications, roles, rights. Go ahead and move forward. So now we want to move into the core of our uh, presentation today around cloud governance and provisioning challenges. I'd like to turn it over to Ali. Thanks, Brent. So what we want to cover is kind of, you know, worst case scenario, um, you're a large organization, large distributed team, and everything's manual. So we want to kind of hit the four kind of core areas when it comes to infrastructure management, um, service request management, approvals, kind of everything end to end. Um, so right out of the gate today, we're still seeing a lot of organizations um, that maybe not across the board are manual when it comes to service requests. Um, they might have an ITSM, there might be a ticketing or a basic form uh, that people fell out, but things certainly could be better. And one of the challenges that we're seeing around uh, manual service requests is people think that, you know, we're still seeing engineers and other team members think that VMs are free because these are owned resources. So I can ask for whatever I want, whenever I want, whatever size I want in the data center. When it comes to cloud, um, it's becoming more and more rare that software engineering uh, would be logging into a cloud portal and using the user interface to manually click and provision. They're doing lots of things via API nowadays. And the API is obscuring to them um, what the costs, kind of all of those hidden costs with cloud are. So short story, people are just asking for whatever they want. They have unlimited access to the infrastructure and that's a big problem uh, for the organization. Next, if we move on, when you have a manual request uh, process, um, that requires manual review, right? So we have to have somebody in the middle, there has to be a human in the middle to review if you're using text boxes and emails and, and open text format. Um, the challenge there is if someone writes you a long paragraph of what they're looking for, or let's say you do have a basic form, but they forget to provide you a billing code and approving manager, et cetera, there's going to be some back and forth. That requires 100% manual review, and those ticket queues can backlog, um, and it becomes very hard to prioritize what's most important. And then next, uh, what happens when you have that kind of open-ended uh, requesting, those manual reviews, approvals become 100% manual. And this becomes a huge bottleneck for organizations. 
And I know that uh, a Colin, our, our global solutions architect, who's going to be demonstrating the, the platform very shortly, um, he's worked with customers who have, you know, two month, four month, six month uh, provisioning times just because approval processes take so long. Um, and then next, if we move on, um, once you've actually received a request, processed it, approved it, so the, the user can have that resource, um, we see provisioning taking days to weeks to longer uh, for certain types of workloads. So end to end, that becomes a huge problem. And so if you wrap all of that up, um, on average, we're seeing um, a two week provisioning time challenge uh, from a lot of the people that we're talking to. But like I said, um, there are months to six months to quarters of approvals and provisioning times at different organizations. So anything we can do to make this process better um, is gonna help the organization and help the end users and just make everybody more productive, uh, make environments more standardized and, and just help everybody across the board. So uh, Anna, I believe you had a poll question. Uh, so we're seeing this two week average provisioning time um, and we're kind of curious um, in your organization, what are you seeing? How, what is the turnaround time from the time that an end user requests a resource to the moment that they get that resource? So is it less than a day? Um, is it same week? Is it multiple weeks, multiple months? Um, so if you can just go ahead and fill in that form, submit that. Um, we're, like I said, we're, we're typically seeing um, at least a two week average. Um, so, so don't put your extreme cases, but on average, what, what are you seeing? So Anna, let me know if you're um, getting responses for that. We have a few responses. If you want, we can give a, a couple uh, more seconds and then I'll be able to share the results. Sure, yeah, yeah, we didn't need a ton. We're just looking to get a, a pulse from everyone on the call today. It helps us kind of steer the conversation. Okay, that should be good. I'll let you know when that pops up for me. I'm not seeing the results, Anna. Did you have any uh, key take? Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Okay, off. so that yeah, that, that's kind of what we're seeing too, multiple weeks. Um, it, it's less common that the average would be multiple months, but I'm assuming that if you have uh, a couple weeks as your average, you are certainly seeing some bigger, more complex builds uh, going into the months. So that, that's great to see. So uh, call, if you pass it off back to Colin, we can uh, move on with the slides. So what I wanted to cover next is to go into how could we piece by piece rebuild this process to make it more automated, more standardized, um, put proper governance and controls in place um, to not only streamline and make things more efficient, to, but to make the things safer for the organization. So yeah, Colin, you can go to the next slide. So I think the first thing um, that I think most people understand this and it's a place that we want to get, but the question is how, how do we implement this and how do we do it effectively? So having a portal, so how do I have an end user portal that's fully self-service, but it's also fully governed, right? So I'm using a role-based access. Um, I can have uh, certain users come in. So for example, Brent was talking about uh, financial operations. I could have a financial operations user come in who only has read-only access, so they can't break anything in the system, but then I can have uh, more complex access or for development teams, I can actually let them use an API. But long story short, how do I build a portal how do I build custom forms, make sure I collect all the appropriate information. Next, after you've collected appropriate information, you have everything you need to know. You can actually automate um, change requests. So Colin, if you wanna move that on to the next slide. So yeah, we, we talked about the form, having something self-service, easy to use for the end user, collect all the appropriate data. That's how you, at the end of the day, you're gonna move into automated change requests. Um, we are seeing on average with the customers we're working with and, and Alcor is fantastic at implementing these processes and working with um, large organizations. Um, it's possible to get up to 90% um, automated on your approvals. You're always gonna have custom workloads. Um, I don't think there's 
a thing uh, as 100% automation across the board. There's always going to be the edge cases, the custom builds. Um, but if we can standardize, simplify, and automate, that's going to free up a lot of time for more important projects like cloud migration um, or other security projects. And I'd just like to add a, a few comments here. When you do approvals, one should always ask, has anyone ever said no? If not, then the approval is really in the way because you're always saying yes. And, and with this approach to automation, you can move much more to auditing, meaning look at the reports on a regular basis and then deal with any uh, people that need to be reminded of policies. And even with edge cases, you can think in terms of, well, let's deploy quickly with something that's close, and then let's go back and make changes to it to get it to where the edge case needs to be. So, so often it's, it's a matter of looking at things around time as the most important thing. If, if that party had access to an environment that was 50, 75% of what they needed with the roles, they could immediately start some work while they address the exceptions to get more expanded capability or resources. That would probably be a far better solution to the business rather than continuing to wait days and even weeks for technical teams to deal with exceptions and come to some conclusion. Back to you, Alex. Yeah, it's a fantastic, fa fantastic point, Brent. Um, when I say mostly automated or 90% automated, that doesn't mean that 90% of service requests are 100% automated. It could be any mix of anything, right? Eliminating nine out of 10 steps for all workloads. Um, maybe you flag everything for manual review, but you've eliminated nine out of the 10 manual steps. So anything that can make the team more efficient and eliminate the you know error prone, uh, mundane routine work, um, is going to streamline um, everything in the environment. So I believe, Colin, we were going to do a quick demo of end user portal um, and then a little bit about kind of um, collecting all that information so we could go about automating a lot of those change requests. So I'll hand it to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Ali. So what I want to show you guys today is kind of what this looks like in reality or what it can look like uh, in practice. So today we're going to be using ServiceNow. We're also going to be using uh, Snow Commander. So ServiceNow is going to be our front end for where those requests come in. So I log into the ServiceNow portal, and I want to go ahead. I want to make a request as an application owner to get something from a service catalog. So I'm presented with a few options here. I've got a LAMP stack. I've got an Apache Tomcat server. If I go ahead and I want to pick that LAMP stack. I'm going to be presented with those questions that Ali was talking about, uh, the, the key pieces of information that need to be filled out for this. And these things are going to be, what is the business application? And then also, what size of compute do we want on that? And I would just add, we're not saying that the world is this simple. It's not for cloud. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to control and governance, these are probably the two most important things. And you could imagine a world in which you could make it this simple, in which all the business rules, all the decisions are on the back end. So that's why we're presenting this scenario today. Just tell us the business application you need and tell us the compute, or you could make it templates or any other simple way to pick. And then we can go ahead, we can put this request into the system. So very simple, very easy way to go in and be able to request something. If I want to go back and say even request the Apache Tomcat server, we can tailor the questions that we're asking those users. So if we want to know what project code is associated with this, uh, we can put in XYZ for something simple there. We need to track an application ID with this. We put in our application ID. This could be freeform text. We drop down fields depending on, on what the structure is you're using within your enterprise. And we can go ahead, we can put these orders in and put these requests into the system. So from there, we can see that with ServiceNow being the front end, and this is Snow Commander right now where I can see infrastructure of AWS, uh, my Azure, I've got some on-prem infrastructure, GCP. But at the bottom here in the tabs, you can see these automated deployment requests coming in. And they're being accepted into our automation platform because they have all that information with them. They had project codes, they had application IDs. Uh, so we've got the answers that we, we need to be able to go and say, yes, we can go ahead, we can go provision this. 
one of the things we can do within the Snow Commander platform is we can set up policies as well. So just as another set of guardrails, more insurance, you can say, let's set up a policy right now for tagging. So tags are critically important, uh, both in your on-prem and in public cloud, but people have definitely been using them more uh, religiously in public clouds now. And we're going to do a tag compliance policy. Snow Commander can act as a central repository for tags across multiple environments. So I've got uh, AWS and Azure environment here. We'll just say we want to run this policy against both environments. Now I've got a collection of all the tags that I have across these multiple environments. So I can decide what are the ones that are important that I want to enforce. Like I want to make sure application ID is there. I need to know if there's backup required on these. Uh, other things I want to know is where did something come from? What is the source of it? So I've got a source tag. Let's mm -hmm. scroll through the list here, which is set for which either application or maybe CI CD pipeline that goes ahead and provisions something. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be populated in that source field. So I want to know exactly where that came from. As we go ahead and we set the policy, I can have this configured to do just notifications. I could have it set to power off workloads, so don't allow anything to run that isn't tagged properly. I can set grace periods from you know, giving people 24 hours to have those tags in place to, to say, no, we want everything to be done right away. And when we go ahead and we say, yeah, let's go enable this policy, we're actually going to do a policy simulation. And 36 uh, workloads are going to be powered down because they don't need that, need that tagging compliance policy. So this is a great way to really enforce what tags are in place and make sure that you do have 100% of your tags uh, set on the resources that you're managing. And uh, this is Brent, I wanna just reinforce, this is a great way to bring in a new uh, approach to cloud provisioning with self-service and yet deal with the entire cloud estate, all the legacy that's been done to date. Because when you put in the top level account and bring that into Snow and ServiceNow, you're getting everything you have in Google, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, et cetera, VMware. And so this tagging is critical to cleaning up the environment and bringing it under control and governance. It's an extremely powerful, powerful capability uh, that can dramatically reduce the time it takes you, often you know, six months to a year and a half for a large cloud estate to get properly under governance and control. Thank you, Colin. The last thing I want to show you guys is just, you know, we talked about kind of initial request of getting something new. There is always day two operations that need to happen, and you need the same uh, automation and form collecting in place to be able to do that to make sure you can do this safely as well. So you can also put this in your service catalog for a change request, where we can say we've got a business application, and if we want to change the instance size of this, we had it set at an A0 initially, we want to bump this up to an A1 now. We need more power more horsepower to go uh, make this application work. We can put day two operations through that same process as well and automate that. So you're not waiting months, days, years if you actually need more resources to run this application. We can uh, automate that as well. So let's hop back to the presentation. Perfect, thanks Colin. Um, okay, so we talked about simplifying how users request, streamlining it, collecting all the appropriate information. That leads to automated change requests, automated approvals. Um, when it comes to actual provisioning, Colin touched on it very briefly, um, but how would you go about deploying the full stack, not just compute resources, not just um, deploying a server that's sitting there with no OS or anything else running on it? Um, so Colin, if you wanna advance the slide. This kind of ties into that Gartner wheel slide, the full process slide, all of the tools, but making it a little bit more about the end-to-end -end resources and the operations of it all. So, um, you know, when we were putting this webin uh, webinar together, we kind of joked about the ServiceNow and Snow sandwich, um, kind of starting with ServiceNow on the front end, um, using Snow in the middle for that infrastructure provisioning, policy enforcement, deploying all of these layers, so doing your compute, um, to a lesser extent, even pulling in from software development uh, tooling like Git, Jenkins, and other tools to build application packages, layering on network security, user permissions, then deploying applications, configuring them, loading data into them, and then hooking up these resources for 
um, best practices. So application performance monitoring, backup, disaster recovery, et cetera. So that is how in a single end-to-end -end process with ServiceNow and Snow, you could actually request, then you could go deploy, put all your security and network permissions, et cetera, then deploy your apps, tie in all your backup, everything you need to do, and you're done. Everything's up and running. And then like Colin said, you can go back to the user catalog and I can change um, the compute resources. I can request changes against the stack. So it really can be that straightforward. So I'm gonna hand it back to Colin. He's gonna show us a little bit more of an advanced uh, workflow. Of course, we can't get into everything on, on such a short webinar like this, uh, but just to give you a sense for digging into the Snow Commander platform um, and building a complex day two or a full provisioning workflow. Colin? Perfect, thanks, Ali. So yeah, we initially just touched on the, scratch the surface on, on what you're able to do with uh, the service catalog and the applications you're able to build. But just taking a look at a, an example service catalog here, I've got everything from, you know, that example, that LAMP stack that we had, to, you know, Kafka applications. Uh, I'm also able to do network deployments. I can do Terraform plans, uh, deployed in containers, getting into PaaS services like Redshift and AWS, RDF databases. We can really create a really rich service catalog. Let me show you what we do to, to make that actually happen. So within, when we're creating service catalogs, the first thing we need to do is we need to add components to it. So we'll just call this sample. And I just want to show you the different types of things we can put into service catalogs. We've got ways of describing multi-cloud templates to build applications that could be installed on AWS, Azure, on-prem, all from a single service catalog entry. We can use the traditional uh, you know, templates that are on your on-prem virtualization, as well as uh, private images or public images that could be in public cloud. Uh, we can leverage marketplaces from public cloud. We can also leverage the infrastructure as code formats that each of the cloud providers provide, like CloudFormation templates, ARM templates, uh, GCP templates, or deployments. And those can really describe a full application stack from you know, the load balancer that's sitting in front of the application to web security groups to RDS databases, and then your compute instances that are sitting behind that load balancer uh, to deploy those in, in public clouds. So it really gives you a rich capability for building out a service catalog. The, the last thing I want to show you is, if we just cancel out this one, we'll take a look at that Tomcat server. And I just want to show you the power of what you can do after you've provisioned the base service. Because as we saw in those initial slides, uh, there's a lot of different applications in the data center and a lot of different tools need to be integrated to get that full working application stack. So when I describe this Apache Tomcat server, we're going to be brought in here and I'm going to be able to specify a completion workflow. In this completion workflow, we have We've got about 11 steps in here, and we can add additional steps. These can be anything from kind of generic steps that can be built in to do custom actions to specific, you know, application-based ones like run Ansible playbooks, uh, salt stack, chef puppet. Uh, so we can leverage those tools. But in this example, what I've done, the, the key ones in here is I'm pulling a YAML playbook from a repository, just using a REST step, and I can feed that into my run Ansible playbook step. Uh, so this way I've got a known source for my application that's being deployed and deploying that through Ansible, which I've already invested uh, some time into maturing that solution. I've got steps in here as well for using Dynatrace for monitoring, so I can put that agent on there, register that with the Dynatrace uh, application. We're using Zerto for DR. Uh, I can also do things like within ServiceNow from here, so I can close tickets that were created when the first request came into this. Uh, I can send an update to the CMDB with some information about this uh, application that was just deployed and the infrastructure around it. I can set power schedule groups to uh, start to save some money on the costing information around here. Uh, if I only need this for you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, I can set expiry dates and I can set policies for how this gets automatically decommissioned. So it's all the tools that we took a look at around uh, fitting into the ecosystem, as well as uh, being able to manage that machine throughout its life cycle. With that, we'll flip back over to uh, the slide deck. 
Great, thanks for that, Colin. Um, so this one's gonna be a quick one, but just to close the loop on everything, if we automate the provisioning process, improve the user experience, um, at the end of the day, we do still need that source of truth. So the CMDB has to be updated. Um, and you can advance the slide. I think we just have a basic screenshot in there, but I'll hand it back to Colin in a second so he can go back and show us how all of the information stays up to date in your CMDB. You have to have your CMDB uh, be your source of truth. And Snow has been doing this for you know almost 20 years now of working pretty closely with ServiceNow. Um, we have an ITSM enhancer tool as well to add as other asset information in there. But from a cloud perspective, digging in, um, and Colin, you have it up there. So yeah, just, just go ahead. But having that source of truth, stay up to date the whole process. And you saw it with the workflow engine, how easy it is to do that. And I will validate uh, all that Ali said. I wor uh, work with Snow uh, over 10 years and with their uh, bringing in the Commander product uh, is just adding more horsepower to you know a cloud, you know, a fantastic cloud-based company that can enrich all the data uh, and be uh, operational data store for that seem to be data housed in ServiceNow. So take it away, Colin. Let's see what uh, has come back into ServiceNow from these provisionings. Yeah, so what we're looking at right now is one of the records within ServiceNow and CMDB. So we can see uh, all the tags that were flowed through that initial request. So we can take a look at the source here. We can see that this was deployed by Snow Commander. We can see the expiry date for when that, we don't need that uh, that anymore. Uh, we've got you know, what organization that's applied to, what's the application ID on it, project codes. So we can flow all of this information from the request and put that into uh, ServiceNow and have that in our, our single source of truth. So now we can go and we can see exactly where these things came from and we have that full audit trail. Uh, there's also another view within ServiceNow which is which is great. Um, if you saw me scrolling through that this item within uh, the CMDB, there's a lot of options in there. There's also a dependency view. And in this dependency view, we can take a look at that, that instance, in this case, and take a look at what the configuration is. So I can see that this came from a Red Hat image. I can see what uh, network it's on, what storage volume it's attached to, what region it's within Azure it's sitting on. Um, I can see where my hardware type went from a basic A0 when I made the change request, then it went to a basic A1. So it gives us a great view of being able to take a look at, at that asset and uh, see the information on it, or we can drill in and get just you know a ton of information that's stored in that CMDB. Okay, great. And I think you know to kind of wrap things up. Um, I mentioned it briefly, but that ServiceNow and Snow sandwich of put, tying these tools together. Of course, there's a whole toolkit that you have of your favorite backup, DR, all your other tooling that you're using. But bringing it all together with these two platforms, we've seen company after company after company reduce provisioning times um, by a 100x factor. So I remember a, a global Fortune 1000 retailer um, who was able to take their average provisioning from five days down to five minutes, um, a large um, semiconductor manufacturer um that was able to reduce from a two-week provisioning time down to 30 minutes and again these are the averages right so if we can automate 90 percent of the work that's how you're going to get to a point where a lot of the workloads are just being automatically provisioned user goes to the catalog asks for something they filled out all the appropriate information that's a workload that can be automated it just happens and you saw with the full stack um, kind of end-to-end -end automation how that's possible um, and then, of course, those custom, more complex workloads, those are still being flagged uh, for manual review and manual execution because there's some nuance to it. So uh, we think that this truly is a way that you can transform uh, your provisioning process. And then at the end of the day, have a fully up-to-date, accurate CMDB across all of your cloud and your on-premises state. Brent, I don't know if you had anything to add into that. Just that uh, in our environments here, we're dealing with non-production environments, you know, tiny VMs, both ServiceNow and Snow uh, in a pay-as-a-go Azure, and we're still seeing five-minute provisioning uh, in what we've been uh, working with as we continue to work across this in the last month and preparing different scenarios for this uh, webinar. So I just want to let you know that with production environments and with templates and other 
uh, triggers, you should not expect any slower time. In fact, I would be examining it. And in fact, as far as Azure billing, uh, you know, we can see changes through Azure Discovery in, you know, like 15 minute, 30 minute time frame. So once things are provisioned, we can validate them with Azure APIs, whether that be the pricing API, a storage API, a disk API, or the discovery API. So with the heavy, heavy uh, use of uh, API commands and uh, templates and blueprints and other approaches, your provisioning should really be in you know a matter of an hour. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I would add, because I, I think a lot of people on the webinar today have heard the automation pitch before, right? So like, of course there's tools out there that I could automate my life. Um, we're talking about simplicity here. Um, this is a platform that was purpose built for cloud and for data center infrastructure. Um, a lot of that automation is drag and drop. You saw the form uh, that Colin was filling out. It's just step by step, just adding simple steps, tying in other systems. Um, we've seen the system deployed in a day and doing full inventory of all your resources and then automation workflows starting to be built in the first couple weeks. Um, so this isn't the, you know, the six to 12 to 18 month implementation schedule. Um, and I know that Alcor is, is one of the best companies out there. Brent, you had uh, one more slide and then maybe we could jump to Q&A. Yeah, so here we wanted to highlight one case study, a uh, very large organization, life sciences. They're regionally distributed with their workforce. They've got operations in many countries, a very large percentage of contractor staff with many vendors dealing with divestor and acquisition. And this is reflected in our relationship with them. So we're in a, a very long-term long -term partnership with them. We're you know, operating service integration and management to give them true multi-vendor management. We're heavily involved in an outsourced PMO, uh, have most recently brought in a large number of service delivery managers. So uh, with a staff of over 60 there, you know, we're heavily involved in this organization. But one, one solution that we've contributed to is was their desire to get to take a cloud first initiative focused on end-to-end -end process automation. So this started uh, with a vision a couple of years ago, and then more recently they brought in this bring your own vendor strategy. So that means the ability for a company, for any party in the company to quickly bring a project to bear. It may require some new technology, a new tool, maybe including vendor services, and be able to rapidly get them the environments they need in order to uh, progress for, to deliver that new opportunity to bring outcomes for the business. So what solution was put in place was largely exactly what you're seeing here with the addition of Ansible and an IP management tool, InfoBlox. So if you, if you just add Ansible and InfoBlox with ServiceNow and Snow, tremendous power being brought to bear. Self-service requests, approvals, leveraging Commander to drive the Ansible and InfoBlox, and then correct application tagging that can support your audits, chargeback, uh, configuration uh, support for incident request change and problem. And this all is enabling users to view uh, what's actually happening with what they're using in the cloud and to make changes to those resources to continue to align to business needs. And over on the right, you can see with this sandwich, ServiceNow, Snow and ServiceNow, all the different uh, suites, apps and processes are being supported across this client. That leads us to uh, our next survey question, correct, Anna? So what we'd like to ask here is to just get a survey on how are you using your ServiceNow licensing today? What do you actually own? And if you can uh, look down this list and check uh, one that applies, I don't think we have the ability to check all, but it basically, it probably is an answer from top to bottom and tell us where you're at, uh, going down as far as you can with these questions. That would help us to understand where, where people are at today in their use of the ServiceNow platform. That would help us understand how much we can leverage in a true end-to-end -end resource management solution that would include Snow. So hopefully the answer is straightforward. If you don't own ServiceNow at all today, click the first box. 
If you're building custom applications, you may only have the platform app engine. That would be the second box. If you're progressed in using a number of the suites, regardless of what that might be from uh, base or standard to enterprise, click the third box. If you are using ITOM suite and have that specifically licensed, we'd like you to click the fourth box. And last, if you have stepped into the cloud management platform, CMP, whether it's version one, two, or three, click the last box. So it looks All like right. we don't have much feedback on this, Brent. I don't. Oh. I did not see any votes coming in. Okay. So either either the cus either our attendees don't know, aren't participating in that part of their business, or uh, may not have it at all. Thank you very much. All right. Is Does this conclude our webinar? Yes, we open to any questions. If we can take those, we'd be glad to do that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ali, Brent, and Colin. What an insightful webinar. There are a few questions that I'll get to in just a moment, but as a reminder to all participants, uh, please send your questions in the questions uh, uh, forum uh, here. Um, let me close the poll really quick. And And one thing I would just add is that if I've learned anything about uh, IT infrastructure, it's that it's custom at almost every single company I've ever talked to. So um, it's hard to answer questions across the board that you know resonate with everybody. But if you need to have a one-on-one -on -one call, you want to dig into your infrastructure, see what the platform can do for you, we're always available for that, of course. Perfect. So I have a question for you, Ali. Uh, how long does it take on average to implement the SNOW solution? So what we typically say is that the system, it can be up and running and as short as 30 minutes. Um, I would say typically four hours to be up and running. Um, you're, do, you're starting to collect inventory across all of your cloud environments and your data center co-location, any other environment. Um, it's an agentless discovery, so it's very fast, very lightweight. Um, so you're doing inventory within a day um, you're doing cost optimization within a week and then automation. Automation is one of those, you know, it can be harder for every company. We typically advise people to start small, um, you know, build a service catalog for a friendly business unit. Um, you know, the people who are not asking for the most complex, the hardest workloads. Um, but you can likely be fully automated for some basic workloads for a friendly business unit within a couple of weeks. Um, and then everything else from there uh, kind of depends on your relationship, uh, other factors, but it, it's pretty fast. It's pretty straightforward. Awesome. Thank you for addressing this. Uh, here's another one uh, for you as well. Uh, what are the typical customer responsibilities during the implementation? Uh, so there, there are two options to purchase the system. You can purchase it SaaS, hosted by uh, Snow Software, or you can purchase it to install on-prem, uh, which is still a common choice. Um, so if you are installing on-premise, um, there's going to be resource requirements, uh, a basic server and a, and a basic database. Um, on top of that, regardless of the implementation, there's going to be working with uh, the security group to make sure that particular ports are opened, nothing too onerous. Um, and I would say that's about it. Um, we typically see organizations setting aside um, one or two people um, to become kind of the experts in the platform so that they could train the tra uh, train others later. Um, and with every purchase of the system comes a three day kickstart package. So you will actually be working uh, with us with Alcor um, to implement the system, make sure that you're up and running, make sure that you're successful and you're start you've done proper inventory you're hooked into all of your clouds and you can hit the ground running um, in every area. Perfect, thank you. Can you help us create an RII to identify the waste and justify the cost? Uh, definitely, yeah, we actually have, um, there's a new ROI calculator on the snowsoftware.com website. Um, it might be on the homepage, but it'd certainly be under products, uh, Snow Commander. Um, you will see that ROI calculator there. That's going to give you kind of the 10,000 foot view on cost savings. So you're you're just essentially telling 
the ROI calculator. I have this many workloads in AWS, this many in Azure, this many on-premise um, in VMware. Um, we're using industry averages for workload costs. Um, and then the production versus non-production split also matters. But that's going to tell you kind of at a 10,000 foot level, um, if you had a thousand workloads, let's say you could save uh, $700,000 off of your cloud bill annually. Um, certainly, if you want something a little bit more deeper, I've built at least 20 different uh, custom ROIs uh, for implementing the solution. Because what you see in a lot of organizations, especially in, in COVID times right now, is to justify the purchase of a system that would be that far reaching, that would manage your entire infrastructure, um, there's going to need to be some justification to finance and other people. Um, and the justification is certainly there. The optimization, uh, the security benefits, the cost savings benefits, they're all there. So it, the ROI calculation can be built. Great. Thank you. And I also have a question for Brent here. If my company already has a robust cloud user base, how can I get started on a model like this uh, with a catalog approvals and provisioning management? I would, uh, the, the most important thing is to uh, work with the people who actually have the top level account control for each of your cloud environments. So you, you may find some others, but you can work with the company AWS, Microsoft, et cetera, and they can certainly tell you every single cloud account that's associated with your company anywhere in the world, and then work to get that under one top level account will be one of the things you want to do. The second is to understand how you're structured in the company and how you want to provide the cost control. So is it by business services, service owners, application owners, uh, IT technology, you know, business relationship managers or service delivery managers are probably some of the most common. So they'll need to be established the ability to work with those folks and understand that they're the business reasons why there is a need to bring things under control. And then finally, focus on the benefits to get the buy-in as you make progress. And then lastly, there will need to be a small team, a very small team focused on tagging so that you can eventually get all of the legacy uh, cloud resources uh, understood and recognized if they're active being used and to provide, again, through organizational change, visibility to the benefits that providing this self-service portal, not only for end users, but for the people who uh, have the um, responsibility for these cloud resources so they can understand what their costs are, what their options and choices are to be able to make decisions to optimize the cost or make changes. Those would be probably my uh, top few things that would would bring you the success. Great. Thank you so much for addressing this. And then one last question that we have for Ali here. Can the model described in this webinar work in a data center and cloud environment? Yeah, definitely. So I mentioned that a couple of times, but certainly the, uh, the Snow Commander product has actually been around for 13 plus years. Um, it started in the data center uh, for virtualization optimization. And then as cloud uh, adoption grew in some of our enterprise customers, we gradually added that um, cloud support, you know, probably nine, 10 years ago. Um, so certainly you can cover both environments. And, and we talked only about provisioning on this webinar, uh, but there's also costing dashboards, cost right sizing, um, and all, all sorts of other cost optimization in the platform as well. Great. And as, a, as we were talking, another question came in here for Brent. Uh, what tags are most important? Thank, thanks for asking. Yeah, tagging is probably the most critical thing in the longest tent in the pole if you have an established legacy environment or unknown environments using the cloud. And so one, think in terms of application ID. Uh, at the end of the day, some somebody's using this cloud resource for some reason. So what is the code? Even if it's just an operating system and that's what they're interested in, perhaps uh, Windows running on Red Hat uh, might be the only reason, or a database that's still software or some freeware they may be running uh, to, to do an evaluation. Um, so the best thing you can do is to have a simple service request that raises an application, uh, create an ID for that app, a purpose for it, and then require that ID uh, on your uh, cloud resources. And then from that tag, you want to eventually you know, follow the trail to ownership 
both uh, individual or group, and then financial ownership to a cost center. So if you can think of simplistically in those terms, who's asking for this, who should be paying for this resource or aware of the cost for this resource, and what is the software that's being used and run. Perfect. And I use, I use the term software very broadly here for the audience. So if it's some kind of code, any kind of code, that's the business reason you're doing it, no matter how technical a person you may be. But we tend to want to think in terms of up to business services. What business purpose will these resources eventually be used for in a production environment? All right. Well, thank you so much uh, to our presenters. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining um, to our webinar. Uh, we are really looking forward to seeing you at all our next webinars. And there will be a quick survey in the end of this webinar. Um, so please feel free to share your feedback. Thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Very happy to have all of you. Bye-bye.